Hello, I'm Kara O'Leary. In each of our video workshops, we at Victorian Video Productions are pleased to bring you an instructor who is a well-known expert within their craft field. Now be sure to take advantage of learning via video and freeze the image at any time to look more closely or rewind and replay the tape as needed to review any procedure. Hello, I'm Kara O'Leary. In each of our video workshops, we at Victorian Video Productions are pleased to bring you an instructor who is a well-known expert within their craft field. Now be sure to take advantage of learning via video and freeze the image at any time to look more closely or rewind and replay the tape as needed to review any procedure. Your instructor has specifically designed this video workshop for your active participation. So each time the picture fades from the screen and the music begins, you should pause the tape to allow yourself time to complete that portion of the course. Now, if the subject of this course is totally new to you, we recommend that you watch the entire tape first. Acquaint yourself with the subject matter as well as the format of instruction. Then begin and proceed through the course following the step-by-step -step instructions. Now, to make sure that you get the most out of the course, please make sure that you have met the prerequisites on the back side of the cassette. Also, please read the supplemental information that's enclosed. Now, take a few moments. Review the information. When you have all of your materials ready, restart the tape. Your instructor is ready and waiting for you. Hi. My name is Deborah Chandler, and what I'm here for today is to help you to have a general introduction to weaving. What I would like to do is show you a lot of different kinds of woven things that are here, and a lot of different kinds of looms. A lot of people know that they want to weave, but they don't have any idea where to start. And what we'd like to do in this general introduction is give you some clues as to what different looms do, what different kinds of weaving is, are available, and why you might want to start in one area or another. In some ways, it doesn't even really matter where you start because most people who weave, weave a lot of different kinds of things anyway. And over a period of time, they try out some narrow things, some wide things, some large things, some tight things, some loose things. And in time, they eventually find the kind of weaving that's most exciting to them. So maybe it doesn't matter where you start, but it helps a lot to have some basic information to start with. So what I'd like to do now is show you some of the things here that are woven and tell you some things about them so that you can decide if these are the kinds of things you'd like to weave. These first sex, the first things here are clothing. And a lot of people are very interested in handwoven clothing. You can weave lightweight fabrics or you can weave heavyweight fabrics. This is a heavier weight, still very loosely woven fabric. It's a top, and in fact, everything up here happens to be a top, but you certainly can weave other things. You can weave knickers or ponchos or jackets or full-length coats or pants or anything else you want. This is a shirt. This is a woven of silk and a silk acrylic blend. This piece right here is linen and has lots of colors going on. It was designed to be woven like an African garment. This piece right here was done for fun. The woman who wove it called it her jelly bean piece because the pieces, the decoration down the front looks like jelly beans, she thinks. It's lots of fun. This is a cotton piece. These are scarves that still fall into the category of clothing. They're very simple. You just weave them straight. There are fringes on both ends. And they're one of the nicest things to weave because they're quick and easy and people really like to have them. You can also weave things for your household. Lots of people wonder what kinds of things in their households are, could be woven. And all of these can be. If you look around your house, anything that's fabric can be woven, whether it's the carpeting, the upholstery, the curtains on the wall, the pillows, the bedspreads. You could weave sheets if you wanted to. Most people don't want to, but you certainly could. This is a pot holder, a little fancier than the ones from third grade. This is a napkin that was woven. Toys are lots of fun to weave for the children in your life who are any age. This is a Christmas decoration that was woven by a woman that 
reverses on the two sides. These two pillows are very different in look, and there are lots of other ways to weave pillows as well. These two rugs have such different characteristics that we'll probably talk more about them later, and there are many other kinds of rugs that can be woven as well, both, both large and small, depending on whether you want to cover a small area or a great large area. Another thing about weaving that is very startling to people in the beginning is they haven't, a lot of people haven't thought very much about the difference between a woven structure and a knit structure. If you look at this piece here, this is a woven structure. And when you look closely, you can see that there are vertical threads and horizontal threads, two sets of threads that are interlocked with each other. They started out as separate pieces and then were woven together. The structure is very stable and fairly rigid, which is how woven structures in general are compared to knit structures. This piece, this afghan, is knit, and if you look closely, you can see the knit structure by looking through it almost. Knit structures are interlaced. Pieces, the yarn is a continuous piece of yarn that loops into itself over and over and over. And I think probably everyone has seen people knitting on knitting needles. To do it on a larger scale, in larger quantities, it can be done on a knitting machine. What I'd like to do now is go and look at some of the various looms that are here and show you what their specialties are, what different kinds of weaving they do. What I want to do is show you this assortment of looms, starting with the most simple and working our way through to some more complex looms. This right here is a frame loom. It's made out of stretcher bars. You can pick them up at any art supply store. And they're nails holding the warp. The warp on this loom is, starts by being tied on the top, and then it just runs back and forth and back and forth all the way through to the end until it gets all the way to here and is tied off. And your tension then is fixed. It can't be changed afterward. To weave on a loom like this, you can use a long needle or a shuttle or something like that, and you pick your way through the threads over and under every one. It's something like what you did as a kid on cardboard or with a pot holder loom or something like that, if you want. And then the yarn comes through, and then you turn around and go back. In a case like this, there's a tapestry in process, and the colors change. Basically, that's the process. If you think about that, it's a pretty slow way to go. It's functional, it's easy, it's easy to understand. It's real slow. A Navajo loom is essentially the same thing, but with a slightly increased efficiency. What happens is they're usually bigger so that you can make Navajo rugs on them. They're warped in a slightly different way, but it's essentially the same thing. And what happens is that in order to go a little faster, instead of weaving in and out and in and out with a needle all the time, this stick is tied with these strings to every other thread. And you can pull that up to raise all the odd threads. And then this stick is woven in and out, and you can lift it to get all the even threads raised. And then what happens is you just put the yarn through. It's a much faster way to go. Now, though, weaving is still very slow, but it's faster than this kind of weaving. On both of these looms, you can weave from the bottom to the top or a shorter distance if you want to. But you can't weave any longer than that because of how it's set up. Now I want to show you a rigid heddle loom over here, which is a slightly more mechanized piece of equipment. On a rigid heddle loom, you have what's called a, a heddle, a rigid heddle. Each of these pieces, each of these individual slots with eyes in it are called a heddle, is called a heddle. And because they don't move, it's rigid. The way this works is that the threads go through all the eyes and slots. And if you look at this, you might be able to see this. I'm not sure. When the heddle is pulled up, the threads in the eyes are raised above the ones in the slots. When the heddle is pushed down, then the threads change places. And then the ones in the slots come up, and the ones in the eyes go down. And what ends up happening is that by just pulling this up and pushing it down and pulling it up and pushing it down, you can weave a whole lot faster. Because each time it changes position, you can then put the shuttle through the space that's created and begin weaving. This loom has the added advantage of the fact that because it has beams here, you can roll an extended amount of warp onto the loom. So the, the warp can be 20 feet long, or 2 feet long, or 6 yards long, or 89 inches long, whatever it is you need it to be for the project. And you can weave several projects off of the same warp if you want to. What that means is that you've gotten into a more mechanized 
warping system and a faster weaving system. The frame looms have a, have a simpler warping system, but it takes a lot longer to weave on them. This loom is, is far more popular for that reason. What, what I want to do now is show you the full harness loom and how it works and the kinds of possibilities that it has that the other looms don't have. This loom is a floor loom, and it's called that because of the treadles underneath, because it's set on the floor instead of on a table. It's a, probably the largest size hand weaving loom, and I want to show you the various parts of it. It's called a four harness loom because it has four harnesses. This is called a harness, this frame right here. On the harness are a lot of individual heddles. These heddles are made of string. Other times, heddles are made of wire or steel. They all work just fine. People have preferences for each. Depends on which one you like. There are four of these harnesses, so this is a four harness loom. Generally speaking, in the United States, looms come in four harness, eight harness, 12. They come in multiples of four. And most weavers probably weave on four harness looms, and then eight, the second most popular. This piece that weaves back and forth, this is called the beater. And what it does is beat the weft into place. And we'll talk more about what the weft is in a minute. In the beater is a reed. And this piece right here is called the reed. It's interchangeable. It has slots in it that the warp threads go through. And the slots can be different sizes. This can have larger spaces or smaller spaces, depending which one you use, depends on how thick a warp yarn you want to use, how fine a fabric you want to weave. A finer fabric needs a closer reed. A coarser fabric uses a larger reed. This is the front beam. This is, this is called the fabric beam, actually, because as the fabric gets woven, it gets rolled around here. In the back, is the warp beam, because before you start weaving, the warp is rolled around that, that beam. This is the back beam. This is the front beam, sometimes called the breast beam. These pieces right here, this whole thing is part of the brake mechanism. And in the front, there is a ratchet, this piece that's gear, and that falls, what falls into the ratchet is called the dog or the pawl. That's this little piece right here. And that's what holds it tight and keeps the warp under tension. In the back is a friction brake. It's a, it's a drum with a cable around it, and that holds it tight in the back. Both of those adjust to move your warp forward or to hold it as tight as you want while you're weaving. This whole unit here that houses the harnesses and the heddles and all of that is called the castle. And you can remember that because if you were going to guard this loom, you'd probably stand right up here on top of the castle. Down under here is what's called the jacking mechanism. And the jacking mechanism on this particular loom is what raises the harnesses, and it happens when you step on a treadle. So I step down on the treadle, and the harnesses come up. If I step on a different har treadle, then because of how I've tied it up, a different harness will come up. How those harnesses raise, the order that they come up in, is part of what gives me the pattern in the fabric. If you look at these two rugs down here, this rug was woven in a weaver-controlled way and the loom did not do it. This gray and red rug, on the other hand, has a pattern that was woven into it, and the loom did that itself. What I want to do is show you how this works. So I will sit here and weave. The way this loom works is actually quite simple. I step on the treadle and raise the harnesses put the weft through. The weft is the yarn that comes off of the shuttle. This is the shuttle. Pull the beater forward, beat the weft into place. Drop those harnesses and raise different harnesses. Put the shuttle back through again, beat the weft into place. And in this particular case, all I'm doing is alternating two different patterns, two different harnesses back and forth, two different pairs of harnesses. and throwing the shuttle back and forth. It's actually quite simple. Weaving itself is the simplest part of weaving. It's the planning and the designing, the making up the patterns. That's the fun part, and it's also the part that gets more complex and that makes your weaving especially yours. Harness looms come in a wide variety of sizes that are useful for a number of different kinds of things. If you have space, a wide one is a nice thing to have because you can, as you see, weave a narrower piece on it or you can weave a big wide piece. This loom right here is designed for portability. It folds up into a very small size 
and it's great for hauling around or for having a, an apartment. It'll weave 25 inches wide. It'll do everything that this loom will do, just narrower. The loom above it, this beautiful piece of red and bright colors, is actually, that is a loom. It's with weaving partway on it. It's a Guatemalan loom, and it's one of the simplest, most primitive looms in the world, and it's still in use. Guatemalan weavers use that kind of thing all the time. Over on this side is what's called a table loom. Table looms can sit on the table or on the floor. This particular one also has a floor stand available, which makes it that much more convenient. It's not that easy to just pick up and carry around as if it were just sitting on the table by itself. It's also not in the way because of that. The primary difference between a table loom and a floor loom is that the table loom doesn't have any foot treadles, and so you pull the levers that are up above the reed, and those are what raise the harnesses. It's easier for some kinds of things to use, actually, than a floor loom, but it's slower because you can't use your feet. Now what I want to do is show you some of the tools of weaving. There are a lot of small pieces of equipment that we use to handle the yarn, to prepare the warp for the loom, to do other things. I want to show you what some of those are and how they work. Now, I want to show you lots of different kinds of tools. As you look at all of these, you can see that there are scads here, and it's a lot like your kitchen. You can have as many or as few as you want. The more you have, the easier it might be to do some things, but you don't have to have all of these. A lot of weavers like to acquire them over a period of time. There are a few basic ones that are real nice to have right from the start, kind of like a paring knife. These are shuttles. All shuttles do basically the same job. They carry the weft, which is the yarn that goes sideways, back and forth through the weaving. Different kinds of shuttles are more appropriate for different kinds of yarn. These are stick shuttles. They're the simplest, the easiest to understand. They're awkward to use. But they're very simple to have, and they're inexpensive to buy, easy to make. You can wrap your yarn around that and then put it back and forth through. It's easiest if the length of your shuttle is the same as the width of your weaving, which is why stick shuttles come in many different lengths. How they look on the end doesn't really matter as long as they're notched so that they can hold the yarn. Boat shuttles, for a great many kinds of weaving, are the easiest to use. They're more expensive. You can't build them unless you have some pretty specific woodworking tools. But the way a boat shuttle works is that the yarn is on a bobbin, and then it feeds off automatically as you're weaving. A, a bobbin, you can wind by hand, but most people don't. You can use a bobbin with flanges on the end, or you can use quills that can be made from straws or from something else. To wind a bobbin, if you don't want to do it by hand, which is certainly preferable, you can take the yarn, wrap it around the end of the bobbin, and then slide it over here onto, this is a bobbin winder, and bobbin winders go round and round, and they fill the bobbin up. This is a manual bobbin winder, this is an electric bobbin winder. Both work, if you're working with very fine yarns, the electric bobbin winders are nice, They're considerably more expensive and so some people don't like to use them, but they do certainly do the job. We'll take that off. These shuttles right here are for heavy yarns. These are called ski shuttles. These are called rug shuttles and rag shuttles. And what they do is take care of the yarns that are too fat to put on bobbins. If you put this around a bobbin, you'd only get about four revolutions and it would be full. So instead, you wrap this up, and if you're weaving rugs or saddle blankets or something else that's heavy, then that's what you can use that for. They're lots of fun. This right here is called an umbrella swift. And you know all the pictures you've ever seen of people who one person was sitting holding the yarn and the other person was wrapping it into a ball? Well, this is the person holding the yarn. It's a lot more cooperative. It's there any time of day or night. It's a wonderful tool to have. And it's my recommendation, if you're only going to have one, that this is the thing to get, aside from shuttles, of course, and, and basic warping equipment, because it's so easy to use. You can go from this straight to the bobbin winder or straight to a ball winder. And what a ball winder does oops, is make balls of yarn very quickly. This is the person wrapping the ball around your finger. This is a round ball made by hand. This is the shape that the ball winder makes. And as it goes around and around, it does this magical trick of making a ball. And within moments, almost, you can make a full-size ball. And then they stack. So you can have them stacked up on your yarn, on your shelves, real easily. It's a, it's a real nifty tool to have. And this will lift off if you want to go weigh it or do something else. This right here is called the McMorrin Yarn Balance. And it almost doesn't fit into categories with any of the other tools. It's possibly 
the most amazing of all and very useful if you have a lot of miscellaneous yarns, leftover yarns, odd lots, that kind of thing. What it does is tell you yardage per pound. And the way it works is there's a balance arm here. And you hang on it, whatever the yarn is that you want to know how much you have. And you trim it off until it's short enough. Oops. We're almost there. Oop. Right about there. Till it's balancing. I went just a touch too far on that, but it's OK. As you can see, it's going back and forth. Take that piece off and measure it. This piece is five and a half inches long. And that means that this yarn has 550 yards per pound. And it's very simple. You take the length of it, you measure it times 100, and then that's the yardage per pound. It's a, it's a great tool to have if you're doing a lot of miscellaneous stuff. As we work our way down the table then, down here are other kinds of tools. Let me move this over a little bit so that I don't have to look through it. These are called temples. They're sometimes called stretchers. They, they've got these sharp little teeth. And what they do is they notch into weaving. And a lot of rug weavers use them. In Sweden, a lot of weavers use them for everything. What they do is keep the weaving the width that it is while you're weaving it so that it can't draw in and get narrower. Keep your edges very straight. It's something that probably most weavers don't use very much. The ones who do really love them. So it's something you can think about but don't feel obligated to have, certainly. This is a hand beater. I showed you before when I was weaving that you pull the beater back and forth, and that packs your weft in. There are times that you want to do it by hand, either because that doesn't pack it enough or because you're on a frame loom, and then you beat it down with that. These come in lots of different shapes, and a lot of them are really beautiful. This is a batten or a sword. It's what we used in the Navajo weaving to open the shed. It's also a lot like a pickup stick and has other uses, too, which we can learn at times. In rigid heddle weaving, it gets used a lot at other times. It's just a neat kind of thing to have around. It's really useful for lots of things. These are rigid heddles, like we looked at on the rigid heddle loom before. And the reason I want to show them to you again is that the spacing on these two heddles is different. On this heddle, the eyes are smaller. The slots are closer together. And so this heddle will take 10 threads per inch, whereas this heddle will only take 8 threads per inch. The difference that that makes is in how, how heavy or fine the fabric is. This will make a, a looser fabric or a coarser fabric. It'll take a bigger yarn because it'll go through that hole. Then we'll go through this hole right here. The equivalent for harness looms are these reeds. And again, we looked at this briefly before. This reed will, have, will take a finer yarn very easily. It'll take 10 threads. It has 10 spaces per inch. This has four spaces per inch. A heavier yarn can go through here you can put a couple of threads in each space in this kind of, of reed. You can do that with this, but most people don't. With this one, you could have, if this has 10 spaces per inch, it would be perfectly reasonable to put in two threads per dent and end up with 20 threads per inch. That's a normal kind of thing to do. These right here are sleigh hooks. And what a sleigh hook is for is to pull the threads through the dent, through the reed. Now, some threads, it's real easy to just stick through with your fingers. Other ones, it's not easy at all. And using the hook makes it a lot easier. So it's a nice tool to have. That's kind of a basic thing you get right from the beginning. Let me get these out of the way here. These two flat sticks, sometimes you get two, sometimes you get three. They're called leaf sticks. And they are part of a warping method. And I will explain it briefly later on in the general introduction and then somewhat more in, the, in a beginning class. As you're learning to weave, you'll learn more about that. This is called a rattle. And it's also part of a warping method that uses leaf sticks. Again, whether or not you have these is optional, depending on the warping method you choose to use. This is a threading hook. What it's for is threading heddles. Again, I thread my heddles with my fingers. I know lots of people who use threading hooks. It's useful for other things, too, from time to time. This is a warping mill. And this is a warping board. These do the same job. They just do it in a slightly different way. A warping board is a yard wide in many cases, not always, but in most cases. And you measure the warp by going back and forth. And I'll show you more about that later. The warping mill does the same thing, except that the mill goes around and around. And so instead of your arm going back and forth, 
the mill goes around and around, and it saves a lot of labor on your part. Like all of this equipment, the more sophisticated the tool is, the easier it is to use and the more it costs. And some people prefer mills and some people prefer boards. And when you get to that point, you can decide for yourself what you like. Boards are pretty easy to make. These are the tools of weaving. And the last element of weaving that I want to show you right now is yarns. Yarns, of course, are a major factor in, in weaving because they're the food of the loom, in essence. There are lots of different kinds, and it's a good idea to know something about them so that you can choose the right kind for the right project. So let's go take a look at some yarns. These are just a few of the many, many yarns that are available in the weaving world. And I want to show you some of the yarns and some of the projects that they've woven, just to give you an idea of the relationship between the two. I also want to tell you something about how to choose particular yarns and what the requirements are for warp versus weft. Warp is the yarn that runs the length of the project, the yarn that's tied to the loom. The warp yarn needs to be strong enough to withstand the tension that it will have on the loom. There are lots of threads being pulled on at one time. It's not simply one thread, so it doesn't have to be an unbreakable yarn. It can simply be a yarn strong enough that when you pull on a lot of them, it's okay. Weft yarn is the yarn that's going back and forth across the project. And because the only thing that's happening to it is that it's getting dragged through that open space, it can be almost anything. It can be yarn, it can be rags, it can be cellophane tape if you want it to be. People weave with newspapers, all kinds of things. Weft yarns can be bumpy or smooth, textured, hairy. They can be any of these things because you don't have to worry about strength and you don't have to worry about how clear it is, how much it will clear itself as you're weaving. We'll talk some more about that at some point. Primarily, the things people need to look at are weights of yarn, how thick they are, how thin they are, and the textures. This blouse was woven with yarns that were approximately the weights of these. There is here a very fine yarn that was used in the background, in the plain part, and then there's a heavier yarn that was used for the pattern, so that it shows up a little bit more. This scarf was woven out of yarns this way. The warp you can see from the fringe is that yarn, and then the weft is a little bit thinner. These are alpaca and alpaca and wool, so they're very, very soft. Nice, nice yarns to use. It's a real soft scarf. This project right here is woven out of a variety of different kinds of yarn, and if you look at the fringe, you can see some of the different textures that were used. These aren't the same yarns exactly, they're different colors, but it'll give you an idea. What's interesting about this project that's different from both of these is that in this project, because they were different thicknesses, they are set at different densities. In this project, the warp is the same set all the way across. It's probably about 18 to the inch throughout the whole piece. In this piece, it was 10 to the inch throughout the whole piece. In this piece, the thicker yarns are set at six, and the thinner yarns are set, they're, they're thin and they're medium. The medium yarns are set at 12, and the thinnest are set at 18. Remember when I showed you the reeds? There are different sizes in the reeds. The closer reed gives a finer set, which is used for lighter weight fabrics like this. The bigger reed is a heavier, heavier, for heavier projects, and it gets used for larger kinds of things or looser kinds of things. And when, later when I'm showing you some rugs, I'll show you some more of that kind of thing. These two projects, were woven to go together. This is a lighter weight fabric. This is a heavier weight fabric. They were designed to go together, but they're, but they're different yarns. This was set at 12, and this was set at 8. These two pieces right here have one yarn the same, and then one of them has a different yarn. This is cotton. It's half cotton and half linen. And this table runner right here was woven with cotton in both directions, warp and weft. This dish towel uses this fine linen for the warp and then cotton for the weft. And so it comes out a slightly lighter weight fabric than this one because half of the yarn is a, thinner, is a thinner yarn. It's also got more linen in it proportionally. These two pieces, this towel and this napkin, are both pure linen and are woven out of a linen approximately this size. These pieces, as you can see, are very fuzzy. They're a slightly heavier weight and they're woven out of mohair and wool combinations. And when this opens up, you can see that there's a very fluffy, soft yarn here. It's really quite beautiful. 
the core of it is not all that heavy, but because of all the fuzzy stuff sticking out, then there is, it takes up a lot more space and it fills in in a loosely woven thing. It's a, a real popular kind of thing to do because it's so pretty. This vest is woven out of yarns approximately like this and like this that are nice, medium weight, wool kinds of yarns. I wanted to show you on this one, one of the interesting things that happens. Anytime you have a wool that's on, that comes on a cone or comes on a tube like this where it's compacted very tightly, when it has a chance to get out in the air, it will open up. On the cone, it's very tight. It's mashed flat in the mill. And later, when the air gets to it or when you wash it, it will swell up. These two yarns right here are actually the same yarn. You can see as it goes down and comes back. But this is what it looks like when it comes off the cone, and this is what it looks like after it's had a chance to bloom. It can make a tremendous difference in your project, and it's useful sometimes to wash the yarn first so that you know actually what you're really dealing with. You might handle this in a very different way than you did this. Other times, people like to weave it up in its still thin form, and then when they wash it, it blooms and swells and fills in a lot of spaces. But it's part of why washing projects is very important after you finish weaving them because it changes them usually for the better, always for the better if you planned it that way. These two critters right here are woven just for fun and with a lot of miscellaneous stuff. And if you look along here, you can see that these yarns are thinner, these yarns are thicker. They change what's happening, and it's a fun way to try different yarns and experiment with them and see what it is that's really happening, what kinds of possibilities you have. The bunny was made and sewn up underneath on the bottom side. The snake was made, he has no seams, he was woven in a tube. And that's the kind of thing that you can learn in double weave and in another way to weave. It's lots of fun. These two, these three pieces here, this vest, this little wall hanging, and this pillow, are all woven in what's called tapestry. They're weft-faced, weaver-controlled kinds of weaves. And the reason I'm showing them next, showing them to you next to each other is that it's, you can do different things with the same kind of weave structure. This yarn, which is fairly heavy, was used for these two pieces. This vest doesn't want to be that heavy because it would be too awkward to wear. It would be stiff and uncomfortable. So she did the same kinds of things, but with a much lighter weight yarn. And as you can see, these silks are a whole lot thinner, lighter weight than these wools. But the techniques are essentially the same. Something that I want you to be aware of is the difference between plain weave fabrics, fabrics with other pattern structures, and weaver controlled fabrics. Those that you're looking at here are plain weave fabrics, which means that they were woven on a two harness structure. They could be woven on a rigid heddle loom or some other two harness loom. If you look at the fabric itself, what you'll see is an over and under structure. There's patterning going on in some of these, but it has everything to do with color and nothing to do with the structure of the weave itself. The next group you see are fabrics that were woven on harness looms. The pattern in these may be partly due to color. It's also due to a structure in the fabric itself. While you can do these on a rigid heddle loom with a pickup stick, they are primarily done on harness looms, and then the loom does it for you automatically. If you're trying to decide which kind of loom to start with, if you like this kind of fabric, it makes more sense to do it on a harness loom. This third group of fabrics that you see are all woven in what's called tapestry weave. The difference between these fabrics and the ones you just looked at is that in the others, the weft goes all the way from selvage to selvage across the entire width of the fabric. On these, the weft only goes part way across, as you can see by looking at the back of the one with the flowers on it. The wefts go part way across, and then they come out of the weave, and that's why the colors change where they do. Tapestry weaves and other finger-manipulated weaves can be done on any kind of loom because it's the weaver who is doing the work, not the loom. These are some kinds of projects that you can do. You can also do wall hangings, and wall hangings can be done in any of a million different ways. Some of the ones that you see here include a variety of weights of yarns. The transparency uses lightweight yarns in the background, and then a heavier chenille yarn to do the picture, the cactus and the sky. The rug that you see that's purple and other colors in that family is a heavy rug wool not terribly heavy, kind of a medium heavy weight yarn from Sweden. It's very tough and very good and very durable. 
Those yarns on that particular rug, you can see the warp and the weft. On many rugs, you can only see the weft. This one is more of a balanced weave, and both are showing. The two wall hangings that are framed here and hanging, one is woven as a tapestry, very much like the tapestries that I just showed you lying on the table. It uses a yarn that's equivalent to a yarn in an Navajo rug, and then it's stitched and stuffed afterwards to give it the added texture. The wall hanging on the right is woven with the, the design is coming partly from painting that has been done on the warp. The, the part that's painted is all silk. The shinier, whiter part is rayon. Some of that piece is warp face. Some of that piece is weft face. And she uses a nylon filament that's invisible, like fish line that goes back and forth as the weft, so that everything you're seeing is warp with a few minor exceptions. All of these yarns that I've been showing you have been designed specifically for weaving. There are other yarns that are designed specifically for knitting and some that are specifically for crochet. In time, it's perfectly reasonable to use all kinds of yarns for your weaving. For now, I'd like to recommend that you stick with weaving yarns for weaving because the other ones have different characteristics that need to be accommodated as you're weaving. And in the beginning, until you know how to deal with those kinds of things, it's better to stick with yarn that was designed specifically for what you're doing. Once you have all these choices, then you need to know what to do with them. And what I want to get into now is the, the nitty gritty of planning a project. There are basically six steps in the whole planning process. What I do when I start is draw a picture of what it is I'm going to weave. So in this case, let's do a planning for a shawl. And I want the shawl to be 26 inches wide and 6 feet long, which is 72 inches. And it'll have fringe on both ends. And what all of this extra down here for is loom waste. The loom there's a certain amount you don't get to weave up because it's at the back of the loom and you can't get to it. Okay. Now I've decided for this, and this is all arbitrary, I'm just making it up. I've decided that what I want is to use a yarn that I'm going to set at 8 inch per inch, which will be a fairly loose kind of thing. I want it to be wool, and I'm going to use one color. That's a good, a good simple one to start with. In time, you'll get into things with stripes and plaids and all kinds of other things. But let's start out with something pretty basic. Okay. My fringe, I want to be, for a six-foot shawl, about 12 inches on each end. And I may decide later to trim it down because that's pretty long. But I'd rather have it longer now and then cut shorten it later. Okay. And then my loom waist, on my particular loom, my loom waist, let's see this. is about 24 inches. That's how much I don't get to weave up. Okay. So I'm going to start with how long each section needs to be. So there's my final figure. Now, what I've done here is all of the calculations I need to know how much warp I need to go and buy. My project length is 72 inches. That's the length of the shawl. Plus 24 inches of fringe, 12 on each end. Take up is, as you're weaving, your warp is straight while it's on the loom and it's under tension. But when you take it off the loom, it has curved under and over all of those weft shots. And so it actually draws up a little bit, and some of it, some of your length just disappears. If you don't know what it is you're weaving, figure about 10%. Some things that are woven very tightly may actually be more than that, and some may actually be a little less. So 10 is a good average. So I need another 7 inches for that. Shrinkage, again, I may not know exactly what it is if I haven't done a sample. If I've done a sample, then I'll know what it really is. If I don't know, then I can guess 10%. Some cottons may shrink as much as 40%. Others don't shrink at all. And you can't say 
cotton shrinks this much and wool shrinks this much because it depends more on how the yarn was twisted than anything else. So 10% is a nice average. So we'll go seven inches on that. Then loom waist, as we talked about, is this part that doesn't get woven up. It will vary from loom to loom. It will vary from weaver to weaver. And it will vary from yarn to yarn somewhat. If it's a very stretchy yarn, it may be different than if it's a very stiff yarn. So I figure 24 inches on my loom. And actually, I, get a little, I do a little better than that. So I've got a little bit of a cushion in there. All of those added up equal 134 inches. And I like to keep it in inches all the way through to the end, because if I round it off now, I may come out too short or, or too much at some point. OK, that's how long my warp needs to be. Now, the width is going to tell me how many threads I need. My finished width, I want it to be 26 inches wide. But to end up with that, I need to start out with it wider. As I'm weaving, it will draw in a little bit. That's a normal kind of thing. It's possible for that not to happen, but it usually does happen. And I, let, I just let it happen. And it will usually be one to two inches. So let's give it an inch for draw in. And again, take up. Oops, that should be shrinkage. It's the same percentage here. I just wrote it wrong. Shrinkage again, I had figured 10%. So now I will figure 10% again. And that's another two inches. So I want that to be 29 inches wide to start with. If I start with 29, I should end up with 26. So that's how wide I want it on the loom. 29 inches times 8 ends per inch, because I had decided that would be my warp set, gives me 187 warp ends that I need all together. Now, if I have a great huge cone of yarn, and I don't have to go get any, this is all I need. I know that I need 187 pieces, each 134 inches long. But if I'm going to now go to the store and buy it, I need to know how much that is. 187 times 134 is that, divided by 36, gives me 696 yards. So I would go to the store and probably buy 700 yards of whatever it was that I was going to choose. OK, that's how much warp we need. Now let's figure out how much weft we need. To determine the amount of weft, first thing we need to know is how long is each weft shot. Now, if the piece is 29 inches on the loom, then presumably that's about the length of the weft shot. But it's not quite, because there is also take up in that. And so one weft shot will be about 10% bigger than that. So it will be 31 inches. We'll figure. OK, this is what I've done to figure out the weft. The warp is 29 inches on, wide on the loom. And so when one weft shot is 31 inches total because of the take up. I want to multiply that length times 8 shots per inch, which again is a number that I've either guessed because I haven't woven a sample, or if I've woven a sample, then I've figured that out from the sample. I counted what I got in the sample. That gives me 248 inches of weft per inch of weaving. As I'm weaving, it's going to take me 248 inches of weft to weave an inch of the warp. Okay. Then I need to multiply times how many inches I'm going to be weaving all together. Now, the shawl itself is 72 inches long, right? But I'm also going to be weaving up the take-up length and the shrinkage length so that it finishes up at 72 inches. So 72 inches plus 7 plus 7 equals 86 inches. So I have 86 inches to be woven times 248 inches to per inch that I will need. And that gives me this great huge number which I will then divide by 36, and I will end up with needing 592 yards of weft. So my total calculations now are that I need 592 yards of weft and 696 yards of warp. If I was using the same kind of yarn for both, I would then go and buy the quantity of what I got if I added those two together. If I'm using a different kind of yarn, I'd buy this much of this one and that much of that one. Basically, that's the calculation process. And it's really quite simple. With a calculator, you can do it in a couple of minutes. 
once you understand and remember all the pieces. The formula is very straightforward. Having the formula in front of you is really useful and you just fill in the spaces. When you're doing stripes, when you're doing something else, you just break it down into more parts, but it's essentially the same thing. With this information, and if I have my yarn in my hand, I'm now ready to go to the loom, or to the warping board, and start measuring the warp to put on the loom. So, let's go ahead and do that, okay? What we're going to do now is measure the warp, which we'll then go and put on the loom. This is a guide string that I have already pre-measured to the length we want the warp to be. This is a warping board, and this is a warping mill. And what I will do is show you very briefly how the mill works, and then we'll actually do the work on the board, because that's the one that most of you will be more likely to have. The way the mill works is that I take my yarn and tie it around one of these pegs, and then the mill goes around and around. And when I get to whatever the length I want is, I wrap around those pegs and come back again. I now have two threads, each a given length. I would then keep going back and forth and do that until I had as many threads as I want. That's all I'll show you on that one. On the board, since this is our real warp, I'll now use the guide string. The string is, we, we figured out our warp needed to be 134 inches long. So our string is 134 inches plus a little bit for tying on to the pegs. So what I will do is start by tying on someplace, and then I'll find a path on the board that is appropriate for the length of the string that I have. So I can come up there. Okay, and that comes right about to there, so that'll give me the length I want. If my warp were going to be an even number of inches long, say two, or an even number of yards, this board is about a yard wide. If it were going to be two yards, I could just go over and come back, and I wouldn't need a guide string. But in this case, it's a real peculiar length, so we make a guide string and we can follow it. So then I shove that back out of the way, because I'll just be following it now. And I'm going to use this yarn for my warp. And because the swift holds it and feeds it so easily, I can just go from the swift right to the warping board. Otherwise, I could make a ball first and then go through the warping board. If the yarn had come on a cone like this in the first place, then I could just go from the cone to the warping board. It doesn't really matter how you get there as long as it doesn't tangle. I want to start at this end just because I find that easier. You can start either end you want. And I will go across here and follow this path. And I now have one thread the length I need my warp to be. Now I'll go back to the beginning, following the path the same way back again. And now I have two threads, if I count right here, I've got two threads that are each 134 inches long. So you'll see that up at this end, what I'm doing is making a figure eight around the last two pegs. That's a real important part of this whole process. This figure eight right here is called the cross. And what it's for, what I'm going to do is come over here, under this peg, over this peg, and under this peg. I could, if I wanted, do it this way. It doesn't matter, as long as I'm making a figure eight. And what this is for is that as I'm putting this on, these are stacking up in order. And when I go to put the, the threads through the reed on the loom, I will take this one, then this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. And I'll take them off of the stack of yarn in the same order that they went on to the board. And what that does is keep them from tangling. You can, oops, there's a knot. Now, I don't want that in the middle of my weaving, so I'm going to back up to this end and retie it. What I'll do is just break it and get it out of there. Get rid of that completely. And tie a new knot at this end, because this will be cut anyway, so it doesn't matter here. If I had, if I left it here, I'd have a knot in the middle of my weaving, and I don't want that. It might save you a lot of time to use what's called a counting thread. Now, if I want to, if I really enjoy counting, I can just keep counting it over and over and over, but I'm not that crazy about counting. Right here, the threads are divided in half. Half are above the peg and half are below the peg. So I can count half 
of my threads here and then multiply by 2, and that will give me the total number of threads that I will have. Or I can count here and count all my threads. To use a counting thread, what I want to do is come up here and count 2, 4, 6, 8, 9. I'll put on one more. down to here. Now, I'll have 10 threads up here. I should. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. I can tie this around it, and then just leave it hanging there. Then when I get another 10, I'll tie this around it again. When I get another 10, I'll tie it around it again. And then when I'm done, I can just count my groups, and that will mean that I only have to count a few instead of all of them. Now, having 10 threads on top, means that I have 20 threads all together because I also have 10 down here. Oops. Now, before I take it off the board to go to the loom, I need to tie the cross in place because if I just pulled it off right now without the pegs in there dividing it anymore, it would all fall apart. So. I'll tie the cross in five places, each of the places that are separated. I can use my counting thread there as that tie. That tie can go there. Now these four are all going vertically. My fifth tie goes the other direction. It goes around the cross itself. I don't want to tie my counting thread in there. My guide thread. And this one is going horizontally. So I'll take it and tie it there. And now I have these five ties holding the cross securely. I also, because this is as long as it is, want to tie a couple of ties around here, further down, just to keep it contained later on when it's in transit. And I'll take this and I'll slide this whole thing off the peg carefully. And being careful not to let that all jump off. See how much it draws up there? If you pull too tight, your warp ends up a lot shorter. I want to tie this whole thing in a knot so that it will be safe. Now, I make a loop like that. Just fold it over and reach through and take that, reach through again, pull the warp through, reach through again, pull the warp through, reach through again, pull the warp through. And I now have a full chained warp. And that's ready to go to the loom. It's safe and secure. Because of this chain process, because it's so common, this whole thing is actually usually called a warp chain, even if you don't chain it. Now what we're going to do is go look at how to put the warp on the loom. What I'm going to give you is a very general overview because there are so many different kinds of looms that it would be impossible to show you how all of them work. The four harness looms are all essentially the same. The warp goes through the reeds, through the heddles, according to the pattern that you want to weave your fabric. There are basically two ways to warp the loom, either from the front to the back or from the back to the front. The differences in these looms that I want to show you have to do with how you tie on. And as you get further into it, either through lessons or as you read the instructions from your manufacturer, then you will find the ways that they recommend for you to connect the warp to the loom. What we haven't covered, which is really of tremendous importance, is all the vast information that's available to you. We just barely touched the surface, and we want you to know that there are at least half a dozen weaving magazines full of inspiration and fun ideas. There are hundreds of weaving books. These are just a few of what's available. There are also over 500 weavers guilds in the United States, and they'll be happy to give you companionship. If you don't know where the ones in your area are, you can contact the Hand Weavers Guild of America, and they can tell you where to find the ones close to you. In addition, there are hundreds of weaving shops in the United States, full of not only exciting supplies to use, but in addition to that, a lot of helpful information. 
I'd like to thank you for joining me today, for giving me a chance to show you what weaving is all about. And I'd also like to thank all of the people who helped me to do it. They loaned us a lot of handwoven things, a lot of small equipment, a lot of large equipment. A special thanks go to Steve Duncan and Lars Malmberg at Glamoka Looms and Yarns for loaning us the largest looms and a lot of the small equipment. I hope that you will have a rich and rewarding weaving career and that this is giving you the good start that you need. Many of our instructors have also written books, and some teach and lecture throughout the United States and other countries. If you would like more information, we invite you to write them in care of Victorian Video Productions. We hope that this workshop has been informative and enjoyable, and that you will find time in the future maybe to take some of our other arts and crafts video workshops. Thanks for studying with us. <laughs>